So you'll be pleased to know that not everybody who works in the space industry um, is uh, wearing crazy waistcoats and losing their hair. <laughs> Sorry, Nigel. <laughs> um, so our next speaker is uh, a colleague um, uh, from uh, Surrey originally. Um, uh, we, work, we work together at Surrey uh, Satellite Technology down in Guildford. Um, when I was thinking about somebody who was just... Um, I don't know, enthusiasm distilled into a human being, um, I thought of, of Sean. And uh, Sean is going to explain to us what you use the rockets for, i.e., you know, you have to have a payload, you need a satellite, something on top of the rocket to make it worth putting the rocket into space in the first place. So, Sean, uh, how to build a satellite. Uh, Thank you. I think the first thing to say is rockets are pretty cool. I don't think they need anything on top of them. Um, they're just really awesome. They're like the biggest, most expensive firework you'll ever want to see. Um, but they are expensive. So it's probably a good idea if you put something on the top of them. Um, so, yeah, this is my name. I'm Sean. And I have been building satellites for the last 10 years. Before that, I was at university. I went to Southampton University. And it took me four years to learn how to build satellites. So I've only got 30 minutes to tell you how to build satellites. So forgive me. You'll probably have a lot of questions at the end. So um, by all means, tweet me if we don't have enough time to cover all the questions. Um, now. I've worked on lots of different kinds of satellites. I've worked on huge projects like Galileo, for example, um, multi-year projects where the amounts of money are astronomical. Um, but I've also worked on these tiny little ones here, and I'll talk a little bit about those uh, later on. Now, if I grab this, hopefully that works. Excellent. So we're going to go through a three-part kind of talk. Now, the first part, why do we even build satellites, you know? Um, like I said, these rockets are pretty cool. Why on earth do we want to put something on top of them? Then I'll go into the details of how you actually do that. And it turns out that no matter whether the satellite's massive and takes hundreds of years, well, not hundreds of years, it feels like hundreds of years, if it takes tens of years to design and build, uh, or if it just takes maybe nine months, there's a very distinct process that you follow. Um, there are some shortcuts you might take, but there is a, there's a structure to how you build these things. Um, but that does change, and we're going through a bit of a change at the moment, and um, I'll go through that and how we might build satellites in the future as well. So, hands up anyone who wants to build a spaceship. You're all mad. <laughs> it's really really difficult. Um, <laughs> it's actually really hardcore maths. Like I said, you have to go to university for years and years and years, and even then, you might not understand all of the maths. Um, so what we've got here is, when you've understood uh, the rocket equation, you then got to go into hardcore rocket science. How do you know how fast the gases are coming out? Um, what kind of pressure is that putting on the nozzle? Are there any things you can do to make that... Um, gas come out quicker. That's some pretty hardcore maths right there. And then, then you've got to make sure that the rest of your satellite isn't going to fall apart. So the stresses on the structure, um, something that the metals can take. And then you've got to make sure that uh, it's not interfering with other people. So are the radios okay? Is it um, magnetically just going to align itself to the North Pole of, of, of Earth and then you can't point at what you want to point at? And then then you've got to put the thing together, and it's kind of like this. You've got lots and lots of people, all with a little bit of a satellite, and you've got to bolt it all together, and it's got to work. And then you've got to be careful, because <laughs> these things are expensive. You know, people have spent decades designing it. They've then put it together really, really carefully, and then you've got to test it um, and, and not do things like this. And then if you're really lucky, and you have put it on top of a rocket, that rocket itself has got to get into space. So you're all mad. It's really, really hard. Why even bother building these things? 
<laughs> Turns out, though, there are actually some really useful things you can do with satellites. And sometimes you can't actually do things on Earth. And it's actually best if you do it from a spacecraft. So these are just four examples I've given. These are the four main things. In the future, there'll be a few more. Um, and we can have that discussion at the end of the presentation. But let's just discuss these four. So the first is relaying messages, like Postman Pat. Um, you want to tell someone something, but they're the other side of the planet. So you could send a letter. It might take a few weeks to get there. Um, you could send a radio message, but then it's got to be piggybacked, and it's got to go through maybe four or five um, different relay points. So you could just have a satellite that's really high up and relay that message around that way. That way you can do it very fast. Uh, sometimes you might want to take pictures um, of the ground for mapping or whatever, and sometimes you can't get to the place you want to take pictures of. The Amazon rainforest is a good example of that. You could go in and um, fly your aircraft there, but it's kind of prohibitive to do that. Or sometimes you want to take pictures of the Earth so fast that you can't cover it in an aircraft in the time allotted, so send up a satellite with a really cool um, camera on it. Uh, do science. Um, I can't get off this Earth, at least not without a rocket. Um, so if I've got science to do um, that just is prohibitive because I've got this gravity pulling me down and the science I want to do, maybe it's crystal growth or something like that that's actually badly affected by gravity. Um, you've got to get up there to be able to do those experiments to find out more about how this crazy universe works. Um, and sometimes we just want to get out there and see what's around. And that's really, really fun. Um, it's actually part of what makes us us. Um, you know, as, as cave people, we might have said, oh, what's, what's over that other hill there? Um, during the Renaissance. What's over that massive ocean over there? And this is just part of what we do as a, as a people. Uh, we go out, we want to see what's, what's just a little bit further. So that's what we like to do when we build spacecraft. Um, so I'll go through the basics. I've only got time to go through the basics. If you're interested in this, there's loads and loads of really expensive books you can buy. Um, and if you are into the hardcore maths, maybe even do a degree in this stuff. So what does a satellite need to do? Well, it's not just about the satellite. Um, a, a space mission is much more than just the spacecraft. So firstly, you've got to get it into space. So that's the launch segment. The ground segment is very important because you may have this really cool thing up in space, but how do you know what it's doing? If you've got science uh, experiments on there, how do you get the results back? You need a radio station on the ground so that you can actually understand what on Earth, sorry, what in space, <laughs> the satellite is doing. And then, of course, you've got to control it. Is it behaving itself properly? And that's where mission control comes in. You've got to look after your satellite. Sometimes a poor thing doesn't know what it's doing, and you've got to switch something on and off again, because we all know that's how you fix stuff. Um, and that's the only way you can fix anything on a satellite. Because once it's up there, there ain't no way you're going to open it up and fix a little bolt or plug something in. Um, that's why you've got to be really careful and test it, and I'll go into that. And then you've got to... You've got the people who actually wanted the satellite built in the first place. Um, maybe you're a sports fan, maybe you're an Arsenal fan like me, and you want to see how badly they're doing. Um, <laughs> so you want to watch all of their matches. Um, maybe you've, you're rich enough and you're lucky enough to have a yacht, and um, you're out in the Mediterranean, and, and you just want to call for that pizza delivery. So <laughs> you have satellite phones as well. Or maybe, maybe you just want to get here on time and you don't know where you're going, so you've got sound. All of these things um, are the user segment. You're using a satellite. So all of those things combined are the space mission. But you got, you lot don't care about that. You just want to build satellites, don't you? You want to build this bit. So what does that do? Um, well, firstly, why not just 
build the way we build stuff here. Um, let's, let's take the example of a car, for example. Um, you know, it, it does stuff, it's on the ground. Um, I could just take all of the engineering knowledge, because I know how to build a car or whatever, um, and apply that to a satellite. Well, space doesn't like you. Um, space is really hard, so firstly, there's no air. If you've got something on your satellite that generates a lot of heat, for example, you can't just stick a fan next to it and rush cool air over it like you might do with a car engine, for example. Oh, no, 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 no. There's no air. So how do you, how do you keep it cool? Secondly, um, you might get fried up there. There's a lot of radiation. Uh, we're protected here on the Earth um, by the Earth's magnetic field. Um, unfortunately, you don't have that in space. So if, you're, if you've got some funky electrical gadget, um, the chances are it's not going to work the way you expect it to work. Um, and there's nothing to build on. So uh, if I've got a Tesla, a really cool Tesla, and I just plug it into the mains to recharge the battery, that's fine. Um, if I've got a regular car, I can just go to a petrol station and fill it up. There's no infrastructure in space. You've got to take everything you need with you. Um, and getting there get, means getting shaken up. All of these rockets are very cool, they're very lovely, um, but as the demonstration shows, uh, it's, it's not a smooth ride at all. So you've got to make sure that whatever you build is going to be able to survive getting shaken to hell. Um, and then afterwards, it's moving really, really fast. Um, has anyone ever noticed an ambulance going past and the tone of that ambulance changes, uh, the siren, I mean. So it might be very, very high as it's coming towards you, and then it goes very low as it's moving away from me. That's called the Doppler effect, and it's the way waves get compressed when something's moving quite fast towards you, and then they get stretched out as they move away from you. So if you've got a radio signal, it changes the frequency a little bit. So you've got to understand that um, to actually listen to your satellite and understand what it's doing. So, a satellite is made up of lots of different parts. People are made up of lots of different parts. Now, in people, we call them organs or body parts. In a satellite, we call them subsystems. So, the first thing is the payload. This is the whole point of building the satellite. It's the thing that does what it's supposed to do. So, maybe it's a camera, maybe it's a, a radio relay, something like that. It's a payload. But then you've got to hold it on something so it doesn't float away in space. So that's the structure. Um, and, you know, we all need power. We have hearts that rush blood around. And satellites need power. They've got electricity. Um, and they have solar panels to generate that. Um, and they also have batteries to store that. We communicate using our ears and our mouths. Um, satellites do that using radios. And we think. We make decisions. Um, how have I made sure that I'm not walking into this podium? I've got a brain, I can see it. I make sure I don't walk into it. And um, for satellites, it's the same thing. How do they know um, to make the right signals at the right time? How do they know to switch the payload on and off? They have a computer to do that. It's the brain of the satellite. Um, we have a skin, it keeps us warm. It, stop it keeps all of the heat in us and it keeps us alive. Satellites actually have the same thing. Um, but it's like that shock blanket material um, you sometimes see marathon runners have after they've finished a race. Um, and of course, what do we have that stops us being little piles of goo on the floor? <laughs> We've got a skeleton. It keeps our structure um, the way it is. And um, satellites have the same thing. They have a central structure uh, that you bolt everything to to stop it coming apart on top of the rocket and stop everything floating away once it's in space. We also know which way is up. Sometimes we get dizzy, maybe we've spun around a lot or something like that. Um, but satellites also need to know which way is up. How do they know um, where to point the camera? How do they know where to point their big dish if it's a relay satellite? Um, and there are lots of different ways of doing this. The main one I've um, pointed out here is actually uh, compasses. Um, if you want to sound really clever like a rocket scientist, you might call them magnetometers. <laughs> but they're just compasses. Um, now, you can only use those really if you're near the Earth, um, because it's the Earth that's got a magnetic field. If you're around the Moon, say, there's no magnetic field, so it's kind of pointless. Uh, the same around Mars-ish. 
Um, so you might, you might just use your eyes. Look at the stars. That's what people do on boats. They, they look at the stars and they can navigate using the stars. Satellites do the same thing. Um, they, can, they have a, a catalogue of which stars um, make certain shapes of triangles, and they just have a camera. You look at the stars, you look it up against the catalogue. Oh, I'm pointing this way or that way. Um, now, that's pointing at the leg. <laughs> okay, that's pointing at the leg. Um, I have to move around, um, mainly just because it stops me feeling as nervous when I'm in front of you guys. Um, but sometimes, if you're a satellite, the rocket may not get you into quite the right orbit, so sometimes you need, you need your own propulsion. So um, a spacecraft may have its own rocket, uh, not just the rocket that um, got you there in the first place. Now here is a real example. Now this mission is pretty special. For a few reasons. It's, um, it's been in space for nearly 20 years. And this mission is actually what made me uh, want to be a rocket scientist in the first place. And I'll point to the reason why. Uh, where is it? Yeah, here it is, the Huygens probe. Uh, which actually landed on a moon of Saturn. And that happened um, in the winter of, in January of 2005. And I was still at university then. And I knew I wanted to do something technical, kind of. Um, I didn't know whether I wanted to build aircraft or build spacecraft. So I went to this event um, called the Charterhouse uh, Conference uh, in the summer of 2005. And there was this really cool talk by a cool guy called Professor John Zarnecki. And it was the first results from, um, from this probe. And I thought, wow, that's cool. Someone built it. Someone decided on what science to do. Got it all the way to Saturn, all the way to Titan, and then all the way through this atmosphere that we didn't really know much about, and then figured some stuff out. We discovered stuff about a planet, well, a moon, that we knew absolutely nothing about. But someone had to build that, so all of these scientists could discover new things. But someone had to help those scientists, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, so, again, this does all of those functions that a human does. We've got a massive dish at the top here. It's around Saturn. Saturn's a pretty far away place, so you need a really big dish to get all of that information back. It's got a brain. Uh, because it's so far away, um, the things we tell it, there's actually quite a bit of delay before the spacecraft receives those bits of information. So it's got to be able to make some decisions for itself. So it's got a brain. Um, it's got a central structure to hold all of it together. And it's got its own propulsion system. The really cool thing about this mission is that it's been um, playing this dance with the solar system. It went past the Earth on a flyby. It went past Jupiter on a flyby, all trying to whiz its way round to Saturn to try and save fuel, um, which is why it's lasted 20 years um, and gone round the rings of Saturn, um, lots of different moons, and now, in its very final stages, it's looking um, in some depth at Saturn itself. Now, there aren't any solar panels on this satellite. Can anyone tell me why? Okay, it's so far from the sun, so what does that mean? Not that much energy to gain. Exactly. It's, um, you can't get a lot of power out of a solar panel if it's that far away from the sun. So, um, like any self-respecting rocket science person, they go, let's go for nuclear. This is really cool. <laughs> so, no, this isn't a big nuclear reactor like you might see in Sellafield or somewhere like that. Um, this is what's known as an RTG, or a radio um, thermal generator. So it's, a, it's basically a lump of plutonium uh, that gets quite hot, and then because of the heat, you can generate the electricity out of that heat using some um, cleverly treated metals. Now, what's the point of actually taking this satellite out to Saturn? Well, to do science. Let's take pictures of this stuff. Um, now, this isn't just pictures the way you or I might see. This is a whole suite of very carefully calibrated, very interesting science payloads. So I'm being quite 
uh, glib when I say it's a camera. It's much, much more than a camera. Uh, but of course, this has a magnetometer on it. Um, Saturn has a very interesting magnetic field, and it's interesting to know what that is. Can anyone tell me why it's on that big arm? You know, we could just put it right next to the dish or something like that. It would make it easier to launch. Yes? So it doesn't get interfered by the metal Absolutely right. You've got lots of electronics. You've got lots of metals. Um, that can change um, the magnetic field. And this is a very sensitive magnetometer. So if you want a real measurement of the surroundings, it's got to be quite far away from all of those interference sources. So yes, that's exactly right. So how do you build one of these things? Well, like I said, it's very complex, but there is a set process. I tried to, um, when I was making this presentation, I tried to step this out so you would only see one step at a time, but, you know, PowerPoint, hey, it's great. So I'm, I'm going to have to use the laser pointer and point to each of these at a time. So the first thing you want to do is un un understand why do you even want to build this spacecraft in the first place? So this is your study phase. Um, does it make financial sense to do this? Um, is it actually possible? What kind of shape does it need to be? Do I need solar panels or do I need RTGs? Those sorts of things come into a study phase. And um, what that tends to be, uh, what comes out at the end of that is quite a thick report saying how you might build this satellite. And you really need that because that then lets you know, um, go on to the next phase, which is writing requirements. Now, this is where you turn all of that decision-making as to what you want to do and turn it into some concrete technical ideas. So um, the requirement might be um, to generate a certain number of watts of electricity, and the reason for that is my experiment needs that power. Uh, after that, you can do your detailed design. Um, oh, no, wrong button. Detailed design. So you might actually be designing the real spacecraft now. This is where it gets very fun. This is also where it gets very, very hard indeed. Um, because you've got all of these different bits and pieces and they've all got to fit together. And then once you've designed it, um, you normally want to ask other people, have I done this right? Um, you know, you only get one shot at this once it's in space. You can't fix it. You can't adapt it, you can't drill a little hole somewhere so that the camera can actually see. So um, you've got to get it right, you've got to make sure other people can check that you're getting it right. Um, and then, once everyone said, yeah, you've designed this okay, then you build, then you build. Then it's fun, um, but you're generally up against it by then because someone's bought a rocket launch for you and um, you've got to make sure that you've built it all together on time. Uh, but once you've built it, does it actually work? You've got to switch it on. Switch it on on the ground, because if you switch, uh, the first time you switch it on is in space, uh, you might have just launched your most expensive paperweight of all time. Um, and it wouldn't even work to paperweight because it's in space. So, <laughs> yeah, test it. Test it till the cows come home. And if you think you've done enough testing, you haven't. Test it again. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, there's lots of different ways you can test it. You can test um, just functionally, is it doing what I expect it to do? You've also got to test that uh, it doesn't overheat when there's no air around. So you might put it into a vacuum chamber, pump out all of the air, switch it on, does it still work? You might also test that it holds itself together when it's bolted onto the satellite. So you might put it onto what's known as a shaker table, and then it shakes the whole satellite, and that's the scariest thing to watch. Almost as scary as watching the launch, but we'll get on to that point now. Um, once you've worked for years and years and years on this satellite, um, you've designed it, you've decided that um, this is actually a good idea, you've put it together, um, and then you've tested it, and you know, it's taken years, you might have been working really long hours. Um, it then gets put onto a giant exploding totem pole known as a rocket. And my God, you, put, you, you cross everything at that point. You cross fingers, you cross toes. Um, and then if you're lucky enough, it does actually get into space. And it switches on. Great. Is it working? Do all of the little bits of the satellite work? And uh, that's what commissioning is. You, you have to make sure that the satellite 
is working the way you expect it to because now it's in space and it's been shaken a lot by the rocket and it's constantly getting battered by all of this radiation. Once you've checked it out, it's like doing pre-flight checks basically, um, then you can go into operations. Now the satellite is doing what it's supposed to do. Maybe you're getting brilliant science back and you're, you're changing our understanding of how the solar system was created. Um, maybe it's just showing you how rubbish your uh, football team is doing. <laughs> uh, but it's still useful. And then at the end of the life of the space, um, you've, got to, you've got to deal with it. Now, it's in space. What, you know, there's nothing decaying it. There's no wind um, taking it apart. Why would it die? Well, there's, there's two main reasons that satellites uh, reach the end of their usefulness. The first is they run out of fuel. Um, maybe it's got to stay in a very specific orbit. Maybe it's got to stay in a very specific... Um, uh, position around the Earth, and that takes fuel. And once you've run out of fuel, it may just naturally drift, and then it's no longer useful to you. Another reason might be the batteries um, on the spacecraft um, have a useful life, and they're just not holding as much power as you need anymore. So um, you've got to be responsible. Um, who's heard of space debris? Everyone, absolutely. So these days, um, we're out of the 60s where people were fairly irresponsible with space. And now uh, everyone agrees we have to um, treat the space environment like we, speak, uh, like we treat the Earth environment. And we've got to be quite careful and make sure that it's useful um, for years and years and years to come. So if we're close to the Earth, we can actually just let the satellite gradually decay um, its orbit and it gets closer and closer to the Earth and then it burns up harmlessly in the Earth's atmosphere. If it's further away, um, maybe we'll put it into what's known as um, a graveyard orbit. Um, and so that's an internationally agreed area where you can just put dead satellites. No one, no one goes there unless it's to die. Oh, it's kind of dark, but there we go. What about Cassini? I mean, it's out by Saturn. Um, should we be responsible with that? Absolutely. Um, we can't just leave it be, because what happens if it crashes into uh, one of Saturn's moons? It's got radioactive stuff on it. So actually, we want to be quite careful with how we dispose of Cassini. Um, so what we're doing is um, we're very gradually uh, letting it spiral closer and closer to Saturn. Um, that gives us great science about Saturn itself, but it also means it can burn up within Saturn. Um, so, who still wants to build a spacecraft? <laughs> Good, I haven't put too many of you off. Um, who wants to be an engineer and build these spacecraft? Great. Um, who does, who kind of gets scared by the hardcore maths? Um, you can still be involved with building a spacecraft. Um, it takes a very enormous team and it takes a team that's dedicated, and they all need different skills. Building a radio is black magic. Um, no one quite understands, well, apart from the radio experts, how these radios work. So being a specialist in that um, is quite important, because then everyone else can concentrate on their jobs and their bits of the satellite. Um, maybe you really enjoy writing software. So these satellites need software, so you can specialise in that. There are lots of different areas. Depending on the subsystem, you can specialise in that subsystem. Or you could specialise in being a generalist. Um, all of these different specialist engineers have to talk to each other. And um, someone has to coordinate that all of those bits of satellite work the way they're supposed to. And that's the job of a systems engineer. They're the glue of the technical team. But they're not the glue of the whole team. How do we know we've got enough money to build this satellite? How do we know we're allowed to launch this satellite? How do we know that the customers who want this satellite in space in the first place are happy with what it's going to do? Um, this is all the business side of building a satellite. You've got a project manager who makes sure that you're actually going to build it on time and get it to the rocket on time. That's kind of important. Um, if you miss your launch, um, you're kind of on the ground for a bit. 
um, are you are you spending not too much money? Um, because at the end of the day, all of this stuff's kind of expensive. And there's lots and lots of legal stuff you've got to understand about building a satellite and operating it responsibly as well. So there's lots and lots of different specialisms um, that you can choose to um, look into. Um, now, there, like I said, there's, there's a basic structure for building a satellite, but there's not just one way to build a satellite. Um, back in the 50s and 60s, it was only governments building spacecraft. And so they naturally went to the most high-tech industries at the time, which were the defense industries and the um, aerospace industries, people who build aircraft. So traditionally, um, they took all of those processes for building really safe aircraft or making sure that this tank actually was going to work the way you wanted it to work because that's a dangerous thing. Um, and they applied all of those um, same processes to building spacecraft. Um, and it means you get very reliable spacecraft. Um, but they do tend to be quite expensive as well. Um, but you need that sometimes. Sometimes the stakes are just too high. Uh, sometimes you've got people on there. Sometimes you've got very, very expensive scientific experiments. Um, and so you need that high level of reliability. Sometimes you have a nuclear-powered laser robot that you have to land on Mars. Um, and you only get one shot at that, so it better work. But then in the 80s, um, some people realized that um, there are these really cool bits of technology that are coming out that are a lot cheaper than these standard um, space bits of technology. There are computers that are smaller and cheaper than dedicated space computers. Um, and so this whole new era of building satellites came about. It was called the New Space Movement. Um, and it was more commercial, uh, and it was based on you know, stuff like uh, taking images of the Earth um, in a more cost-effective way, or maybe um, satellite phones, stuff like that. Um, but that didn't mean that the other way of building satellites died off. It's just the market itself grew. And that's happened again very recently. I was lucky enough uh, to be part of this movement uh, where people realized, hang on, what's this? It's a mobile phone. It knows which way is up, it's got radios on it, um, it's got a camera on it, uh, it's got a very, very cool processor on it, so it's very intelligent. This is pretty much a satellite. It does all of the same things. If I just slapped a few solar panels on there, it, it would work in space. And so other people realized this as well, and we started taking those electronics and putting those into even smaller spacecraft as well. Um, and so this is the New Space 2.0 movement. Um, and this is, a, this is another level of um, faster, cheaper, um, not necessarily better, um, but it, it fills a niche in the market. Now, all three of these exist now. Who knows what New Space 3.0 will bring us? And the whole point is it's industries bouncing off each other. So the mobile phone industry has given us huge amounts of research um, into new battery technologies. So the space industry can take that. It's like, great, our batteries are now half uh, the weight they used to be. Um, but aircraft have also taken that technology. And so you have um, aircraft that are mainly battery powered now. Uh, the automotive industry can um, have very cool technologies for self-driving. You know, the cars that drive themselves, that's madness. But there's there's real safety behind that software, but also very clever decision making. So maybe we can start taking all of that technology and bringing that into our spacecraft as well. Um, and there's lots of different industries and they're all bouncing off each other. And what's happening now, if you, if you look at the trends in Silicon Valley and uh, further afield, they're all sort of mushing together. Everyone's starting to use the same technologies, the same software. And so in 10, 20 years' time, I, I wouldn't be surprised if 
if you wouldn't identify yourself as a space engineer or a car engineer or an aerospace engineer, you might just identify yourself as an engineer and you may one time work on a satellite, you may one time work on a, on a car. You know, there's, there's this coming together of all of these different technologies and that's great for everyone. Um, so, building a satellite is hard work. I hope I haven't put too many of you off. <laughs> but let's just recap. So, why do we even want to build these things? Well, sometimes we kind of have to, because in space is the best way to do some of these things. It's hard work, but it's the best way to do a few of these things. Um, I've gone through some of the basics. Space doesn't like you, um, and that's why building satellites is hard, because you've got to make sure that it can look after itself in quite a nasty environment. You've got to design it very well, you've got to build it very well, and then you've got to test it very well. Um, and it's not just about the satellite itself. There's a whole other set of um, segments that go with it. And the future is just a whole diversification. There's lots of different ways to build satellites these days. And the market is expanding. It's a great <coughs> time to be a rocket scientist. Um, and it's worth it. Because finally, you get something in space. This is the European Space Agency team. Um, they actually landed something on a comet. <laughs> How crazy is that? Um, and, it, you know, it took a lot of hard work. Um, but it's worth it. Look at how happy these people are. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is SpaceX Mission Control. This is the first time they um, took a Dragon capsule um, and they got it to dock with the International Space Station. So that's Mission Control and everyone's giving it high fives because, hey, we're, we're, we're in California, dude. Um, but then that's not the whole team. When the camera pans around to the left, um, you'll see the whole of the SpaceX team. And there's nothing more bonding. The, these, are, these are real family mentalities. When you work this hard on a spacecraft for this long, and it actually does what you want it to do, it's one of the best feelings in the world. Um, it's not just SpaceX who build uh, rockets that land. This is Blue Origin. And again, you'll see this family of engineers go nuts when their <laughs> rocket actually lands on the ground. There we go. Um, and what's the last one? Oh yeah, if you're building a nuclear-powered laser robot to land on Mars. <laughs> Pretty awesome feeling. <laughs> and that's, that's the thing. Hard work means the payoff is a lot of fun. The only thing I can think of in my own experience that's harder work and more rewarding um, is being a dad. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I think we've got time for a couple of quick questions just before we go to a break. <laughs> you don't get off that lightly, mate. And then catch us at break if you've got any more questions. But would anybody like to ask Sean a question? There's one up there, I think. I want to design a space yacht. <laughs> not a satellite carrier with a people carrier to go around the moon and come back. Is that possible? How much money do you have? <laughs> well, I get 160 quid a week. My best advice to you is um, find a very rich person with a lot of imagination uh, to back you up, and then find a whole bunch of experts who think it's a really cool idea. Um, nothing is impossible in this world. More there. So you spoke about um, the possibility of building very small satellites, mm. maybe around the size of a mobile phone. Um, how much does it cost to get those things into space? And can you envision a time where a small company or maybe a school could uh, build something like that and get it into low level? All of those things are already happening. Mm -hmm. So um, there's actually a name for them, they're called nanosats. Um, and there's even a more specialist term within nanosats called CubeSats, and they, they're all the same shape and size. They're all um, based on cubes. 
unsurprisingly, uh, which are 10 centimeters by 10 by 10. Um, the going rate for launch uh, varies quite a lot depending on who you launch with um, and you know lots of weird legal stuff that I wouldn't really have time to go into. Um, but it can range anything from $30,000 per kilogram uh, all the way up to maybe sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 per kilogram. So it's not cheap. Um, schools do get involved with building spacecraft quite a bit. There's, there's lots of wonderful programs out there from space agencies. NASA has the Alana program, um, and ESA has a similar program, Fly Your Thesis, and things like that. Um, so get involved. There's there's lots and lots, there's probably representatives of NASA and the European Space Agency in this room. Uh, find them, and they will get you in the right um, get you into the right rooms, talking to the right kinds of people. Uh, schools are really important. The only reason we can carry on doing this cool stuff is because kids get really excited about space and they de they end up being rocket scientists. Um, I ended up one because I saw really cool pictures from Titan and so getting involved with that in a very early age is quite important because you have to take the right subjects at A level um, it's, it's pretty hard so you need dedication and if you can have the opportunity to build something a lot earlier in your academic life brilliant Thank you very much so I'm going to suggest that we break for coffee and refreshments um, and stuff like that for now. Um, please be back in here in your seats for half past 11 uh, when Matthew Stuttard will be talking to us. Thank you very much. <laughs>